All right, so yeah, thanks for um, inviting me to, to speak uh, today. My name is Maggie Mermans. I'm a senior conservation officer with the Department of Environment and Science. And my area really is within the koala operation space. So anything to do with community engagement, um, citizen science and education towards koala conservation for Southeast Queensland and parts of Queensland, uh, other parts of Queensland as well. Uh, before I go into the presentation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting today, the Kabi Kabi uh, people. Um, and also acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, before we go into how citizen science is supporting koala conservation in Queensland and how we can integrate some of that information and data into our mapping and making sure that that is contributing to conservation of koalas as part of um, government efforts, um, I'd like to set the scene first on... on how that kind of became to be integrated. So it started off with 2015, where a Uniquest report actually demonstrated a decline of about 84% of koalas um, off the, koala, the Great Koala Coast um, between sort of 1996 and 2014. And you know that was obviously very concerning because there were a lot of conservation measure, measures that were happening in that space. Um, and so Queensland government really looked at, okay, well, what is happening here? Um, what is what is curating the the issue that you know we're still having a decline in koalas even though there's koala conservation measures in in, in place um, in that period of time? So the koala expert panel uh, came on board, which consisted of you know a range of koala experts, uh, well established within the region, and they did a review of that particular you know those conservation measures in place, and that re reported on that. And they came to the conclusion that it really was a lack of strategic and coordinated and collaborative approach of those conservation measures that there was still that decline happening. So in order to really reverse that decline, there really needed to be something that really ensured a better strategic approach, a better collaborative approach um, towards those, the koala conservation. So as a response to that, the report that they and the recommendations that they came out with was about six recommendations. Um, the Queensland government um, submitted that uh, within the 12 months of their review, um, they would build on that in terms of the Southeast Queensland Koala Conservation Strategy to take into account those recommendations and to focus on the areas of highest priority. So in that time, so it was launched in August 2020, um, there were new koala conservation actions in place. And a, came with you know, new threat mapping, new koala priority um, areas, core koala priority areas um, as well, and um, particular areas to target. So this strategy is currently finishing in 2025, um, but it really is delivering on those six recommendations that were mentioned by the koala expert panel. And it's really focusing around community engagement, um, collaboration, strategic approach. Um, it also focuses on areas of really the highest likelihood of success and it really establishes those foundations for recovery and growth of koala populations. So those targets really include, you know, stabilising koala population numbers in southeast Queensland, but also around koala habitat and a net gain in the total core koala habitat area. It includes koala habitat restoration where we're commencing rehabilitation to restore 10,000 hectares of koala habitat and focuses around threat reduction. So commencing 10 programs in threat priority areas to support at least 25% of reduction in disease, injury and mortality rates in those locations. And as we all aware, those targets, you know, they um, have, you know, particular in, in koalas in particular, we all know that they are endangered now in Queensland. And especially with you know current sort of pressures on housing, and you know unless you've been living on a, under a rock, we all realise you know there is this pressure on housing and housing prices and um, and living, and you know we've got this population growth happening as well. So this also brings a lot of pressure um, onto sort of the conservation of, of koala habitat and, and restoration efforts, and it also comes with you know that koala habitat loss. In addition to that, there are a number of other threats other than this habitat loss. Um, some of you may be familiar with that already, but we do have, you know, interactions with um, sort of pets, domestic, domestic pets that are causing a, an issue for koalas. 
It's got about 100 koalas each year that uh, we um, are having a sort of a negative interaction with dogs. 75 of those won't survive that interaction. So there is, you know, that, that data that is available around that space as well. In addition to that, we have the Committee on Retrovirus and um, in the last six years, we've lost about 3,156 koalas due to the chlamydia and retrovirus um, in koalas. And here at actually University of uh, Sunshine Coast, there is you know, work being done uh, right now as I speak uh, regarding the um, koala vaccination or the vaccination to um, you know, mitigate uh, some of those uh, uh, yeah, threats to do with, with uh, chlamydia and, and sort of the resistance. Of the, of the virus as well, which is proven to be quite successful. It just hasn't been really rolled out um, at a larger scale, but um, it shows that within the populations where it's been tested, it's been uh, really quite successful. So how are we going to achieve those particular targets that I just introduced, so that all those four particular targets that I spoke about? Well, the six targets are the six areas that um, the, uh, the panel actually included was around habitat protection, habitat restoration, threat management, improved mapping, monitoring, research and reporting, community engagement and partnership and strategic coordination. Really, that sort of encapsulate all those particular areas. I'm going to focus this talk in particular around the community engagement space, citizen science and education, because that's my uh, role in, in the department and my expertise in this area. Um, if you would like some more information about habitat protection and restoration, I'm happy to speak to you afterwards and um, include some of my colleagues in, in that discussion as well. So some achievements, what we have, in, at least in the last sort of 12 months that I'm, I'm kind of focusing on here, um, in that space, in the community engagement as well as citizen science space and education, um, are really focused around these four particular areas. There's the Q Wildlife um, Citizen Science Platform that has been uh, officially formally launched and is um, becoming really a wonderful platform to uh, to record koala sightings and I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, there's been a development of teaching resources to assist consistent messaging. Uh, we've noticed that there's a lot of teaching resources out there in, koala, in the koala space, space which is fantastic. Um, however, to ensure consistent messaging and um, improve some of that consistent conservation action um, it's really great to have some teaching resources that are actually matched to the um, curriculum, to the Australian curriculum, are freely available and provide really sort of clear uh, guidance to teachers that are able to deliver that themselves rather than including sort of an external um, to deliver those particular programs. We also have the Koala Survey team as part of DES that's doing some wonderful work in um, state-of-the-art koala habitat mapping and they're working kilometres and kilometres each year to um, to access some of the, the private and state land in order to uh, create some transects and, and to contribute to the mapping um, for sustaining koala populations and really get an understanding of, of the populations in those particular areas. We also have really been focusing around um, koala forums and, and co-design events to, to bring together you know, those stakeholders, ensure that partnership and collaboration is happening, that not everyone is working in silos, but we're actually sharing and, and understanding what, what each other is doing in that particular space. Um, as part of sort of the engagement as well, and it's it's a large space when we're talking about koala engagement and collaboration. Um, you know, in, in order to reduce the threats to koalas, we've actually invested about six million dollars to reduce those threats um, and to in create and implement the co-design as well. So it's really focusing on car strikes, fire, climate change, dog attacks. There's a lot a lot of threats that we need to work along. But when we're focusing around the engagement space as well, um, you know, things like trialing koala safety shields for installation on sort of the major highways. Are those signs effective? Are they working? Um, is it changing behaviour? Are people slowing down? Is it in the right location? Do we need to move that sign somewhere? It's all to do with engagement, human behaviour. So it's really important to get really uh, an understanding of, of what's happening and, and how we're doing that. So there's some other spaces as well in this, um, in this area as well. And I'm just getting the sign, so I'll have to move along. Um, when we're now focusing on the citizen science area here, um, I just wanted to introduce the sightings app Q Wildlife. And you might have heard this before. I just wanted to see hands if you've already downloaded this app. Yep. Have you heard of this app? Yep. Have you already logged a sighting on this app? Not very many. Okay. That's interesting. 
So we actually won an award with the Geospatial um, Excellence Award for um, impact, for, for impact uh, of, of community impact. Um, and it actually um, includes the entire Queensland. So you can map all koala sightings uh, within Queensland, um, injured, dead, sick, and healthy koalas on there, which creates a really great platform to have an understanding of what's happening in particular areas. Um, in addition to that, um, you can create some, put some comments in there and, and really um, help to recognise sort of, um, injured koalas as well or sick koalas. Like, you know, in, in other apps you might be able to log your koala site, but here you can actually, it helps you to identify, well, what does a sick koala look like? And, and what do I do when I find it? What number do I call? And that's really helpful in this instance here. So there's some good pictures here of a, of a koala. Um, in addition, you can actually also uh, filter out the data on, on injured and sick koalas um, and log photos with that at the same time. So this is actually a koala that has logged and has fallen out of a tree and you can see it's got a, a wet bottom as well. So there's some really interesting photos that are being, um, being shared on that. Dead koalas as well, it helps us to really identify where some of those hot spots are. And it also helps with sort of that raising awareness about what's happening, vehicle strikes. Um, and really find where are some of those hotspots and what can we do as a government in order to focus on which particular hotspots. Our survey team can only cover so many areas in Queensland. Um, you as citizen science, scientists are able to really get into all these different areas, especially with dead koalas that don't always get reported um, because they may end up in a forest somewhere and they may not be able to be found and they don't always get reported because it's not really a life sighting. So it's really important to, uh, to continue on with that. There was a koala count between 30 September and 15 October and 10 councils actually used this particular app and there were 977 sightings that reported through that with 536 sightings in the Moreton Bay region, which is pretty amazing. Um, councils, and specifically uh, Sunshine Coast Council, used some of those images for that outreach event where you can see one here in a suburban area sort of crossing the road, which is really helpful in, in, type, in that education saying, look, you know, you they are moving around, especially now it's, it's breeding season. The app's been downloaded about 23,000 times, um, which is really a, a, an amazing a number since it started. And in January this year, only 24 sightings were logged. Now we're in September, or in, back in September, we had about 1,100 sightings that were logged of injured, uh, dead and healthy koala. So this app allows you to do all three, which filters it out. There's some sort of updates coming up, but especially, you know, if you submit your images, there is a Creative Commons license attached to it. You will be acknowledged um, if you want that uh, being acknowledged. So that, that's all included in that. There's some privacy um, terms in that as well. So it is all very safe. Um, but important to really remember is to report your sightings really once. Um, I know there's lots and lots of apps out there and we've just been introduced to, you know, the Koala Spotter app, Design Naturalist. There's all different types of apps out there. Um, and, you know, I'm joined today with my uh, colleague James, um, James Wilson, we're back from WildNet, and John Hodgen as well with Threatened Species, and we all really would like to have, you know, this one platform that you can use, so it's not actually backlogging WildNet in the end, so you have duplicate sightings. So if you choose to actually log a sighting of a koala, just use one platform, because that means that the backlog is actually not going to be created at the back end, as well with Q Wildlife, we are able to ensure that the, the mapping is improved as part of the statewide and for Queensland government, so we can then use that for our planning and conservation measures. But then again, um, citizen science is not the only piece of data that we use. You know, it only tells a bit of the story and we've got to make sense of what is happening as an entirety. It's only the data that we use for citizen science is numbers, but we have to understand why this is happening and that's why we need to speak to communities and we need to speak and understand why certain behaviours are happening. And that's a lot of the work that we're doing as well. Gathering yeah, qualitative data, understanding why certain things are causing certain behaviours and only with that additional information we're able to really understand what conservation measures we need to be able to put in place to protect and conserve um, koalas in general. So there's a couple of things you can do yourself as well, and I'm sure you're doing plenty of these already, um, but most importantly is to, yeah, what you're already doing and continue doing that, and we really thank you for continuing to log in, that, uh, in, in koalas. But hopefully you'll be able to download Q Wildlife today. You can view your sightings 
uh, of koalas in your local area and really zoom in and really get an understanding of, of what's happening in your local area anywhere in Queensland. Thank you.